Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Joseph. Joseph, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, uh, great to be with you. I'm Joseph McBride. Uh, I've written two books on the Kennedy case, um, Into the Nightmare, My Search for the Killers of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett, I published in 2013. And uh, last December, I did a book called Political Truth, The Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, which is a subject I've been interested in for a long time. I've been researching the case um, diligently since 1982, and uh, Into the Nightmare took 31 years to, to uh, research and, and write, and I'm still researching it all the time. I was a volunteer for Kennedy in 1960 on his Wisconsin primary campaign. I took this picture of him in the background, if you can see a close-up of him. I... Uh, I was, uh, I met him a couple times during the campaign. I was concerned about his security because I realized he was very vulnerable, uh, such as in this picture I took from three feet from his head. I, I blew off a flash bulb in his face and I realized immediately this was very rude and he looked shocked and he recovered quickly and smiled, but I, I was aware that he was very vulnerable. So I wrote a short story about his assassination in 1961 for my high school English class. I was concerned about it. I also was a student of the Civil War and the Lincoln assassination. I was aware of uh, how these things happen. And so I wasn't completely surprised when he was killed, but I ran to a radio from my school uh, in Milwaukee. I was told in the cafeteria line that he was shot. So I ran to a radio in a drugstore and listened to the reports 10 minutes after it happened. And all the, all the first reports for 20 minutes said he was shot from the front, uh, from the railroad bridge or the grassy hill in the front, which we now call the grassy knoll. And then at one o'clock they changed the reports saying he was shot from behind from a building called the Texas School Book Depository. But they didn't explain why they changed the direction of the shots. And, and that, was, I was already a journalist. Uh, I've been publishing articles for three years and I was the editor of my high school paper and my parents were journalists. And I'm, I have a keen antenna for the news, which helped me with my new book, Political Truth. It's all about the media lying to us about the case. But uh, I was aware that when you change the story like that without explaining it, there's a red flag goes up. And I, you know, if they'd explained why they were saying that, or if they said shots came from two directions, I, you know, would have been more credible. But uh, I, I, later that day, when you saw Oswald being dragged through the halls saying he didn't kill anybody, I believed him. And then his press conference at midnight, I believed that. And by the end of the day, I was not believing the official story. I went through a period where I was. Uh, uh, confused by the Warren report, and then I began reading other versions by other people, and, and my skepticism was renewed. And it's only it's it's a lifelong endeavor for me to study the case. Uh, I haven't been around long enough to make it a lifelong endeavor yet, but I'm definitely interested, and I'm definitely have a lot of questions that I want to ask as well, too, especially about the Tibbet scenario. Um, because I had Dale Myers on the show that kind of he gave me his side of things. And I think there's a little bit more conspiracy behind it, mostly on the aspect of I fall in line more with Oswald was a patsy. But real quick, before we touch on that, I want to go to the aspect of what do you think really was this idea of a change of narrative between the media reporting a certain thing? Do you think that was like that uh, amount of time was enough for every single, you know, government agent or whoever to be able to get in touch with the radio just to make sure? Because we all know from the Warren Commission, they had three bullets. That means they were not going to let this leak out into conspiracy. They weren't going to leak, let this leak out into multiple shooters. But I mean, from if you look at Oliver Stone's film, Destiny Betrayed or Revisited, whichever the two hour or four hour version, 
there's, uh, I think it's Robert Feynman or someone like that from NBC or CBS or whoever came out with this paper and showed that there was a bunch of statements from heads of news networks that were saying we weren't going to go against the official report of the Warren Commission. And for that, I go, you're incentivized to play ball because they gave these people exclusive interviews. They gave people a lot of things. It was better to play ball than go against the narrative. And I start going like, this is where we start seeing the power of the media and how influenced they are into the public's opinion of things, especially on reporting. But if you do a survey of events of that, anybody that saw what happened or heard what happened that day, or all the evidence that led up for like the I guess probably the most accurate news reporting I would say would be the day of the assassination. Everything after that seems like it's tainted in a sense, but I go, there's like 70% of people think that there was a conspiracy on the JFK thing. But what you always hear about is the, the, the 30% being the majority. And that's not the truth. But even now, people that get public television spots or Emmys or whatever, they're people that agree with the official narrative. But I think anybody that really looks into it can tell that there's a definite conspiracy involved in it. Yeah, you've raised a lot of good questions and good points there. Uh, there's, you know, from the very first day, I mean, there is a kind of a um, myth in the media that um, don't believe for first reports because they're often wrong. But actually, it's the opposite. I believe that often the first reports are more accurate before they have time to change the stories and put pressure on witnesses. And obviously, when there's some catastrophe that happens, there are some conflicting reports and some reports are confused and some eyewitnesses are confused. But um, a lot of witnesses have come forward and been interviewed by uh, mostly amateur researchers. You know, the professionals blew the case basically from day one and it's it's uh, amateurs, amateur historians and uh, people people uh, like me who, you know, I mean, I, I'm a film historian mostly, but I my, I my real interest is the Kennedy case. So I've spent parallel life researching it. And there are a lot of people like me who, who are very devoted to it. But um, uh, a lot of uh, good witnesses have come forward and, and, and you can evaluate their credibility by whether they stick to the story or if they keep changing the story, then you, then you discount them. But um, the media, uh, I, I think you hit early on in your comment, one of the main points about the media, very simple, they want access. And if you're at a president, like for example, Helen Thomas, who is a very good reporter for the UPI, um, she, uh, pro she covered many presidents going back to Kennedy and uh, during the Bush years, she was very sharp in her questioning about the Iraq war, <clears throat> which she realized was a, a sham. And so the Bush administration, um, uh, ostracized her. She used to sit in the front row as the senior correspondent. They wouldn't call on her after a while. And so then her news, her, her, her syndicate, the Hearst syndicate uh, fired her because she didn't have access. They wouldn't answer her questions. So she wound up writing for some kind of a throwaway uh, paper in the suburbs, you know, this distinguished correspondent. That's what they do to you uh, if, if you're a dissident. Uh, but there aren't too many people like that because they want to keep their jobs. And my parents, they were newspaper people and they, they were uh, middle class people. The salaries weren't great in those days. Uh, but today the salaries have gone up, especially if you work for a, a, a you know, network or a big newspaper like the New York Times or the Washington Post, you get a good salary and you don't want to lose it. So that's a powerful incentive for anybody uh, to, to hew to the official line. The, it's interesting to study, and I've done this in my books, the official line, how it came together. It, it wasn't totally clear for the first day or so, even the first weekend and, and the first few weeks, there were conflicting reports that came out. And it's very interesting to study them uh, to see how the story evolved. Uh, but a lot of it was uh, parceled out to the press quickly, you know, suspiciously quickly. Uh, and there was, for example, a CIA connected reporter named Hal Hendricks in Florida who uh, called um, 
uh, around and, and gave other press people a, a wealth of information about Oswald, who I believe with you was the patsy in the case, and he was connected with the CIA and he was an FBI informant, but he didn't realize he was going to be the patsy. He, he actually, I believe, infiltrated the plot for the FBI. He didn't know he'd be set up until it happened. But Hendricks called, and they had a lot of propaganda about Oswald being a communist sympathizer, which uh, he was posing as a communist sympathizer, in my opinion, uh, as a provocateur, uh, as a false defector to the Soviet Union, for example. And he staged some incidents in New Orleans in the summer of 63 to make it look like he was a communist Castro sympathizer. That's what his sponsors were trying to get him to do. Um, so all this stuff was poured out into the media. By the end of the day, the media were convicting this man on television. And that's, I was only 16 at the time, and I was kind of naive in some ways. And that's when I realized we try people in the press, and we should try them in court, not in the press. But to, even today, you see all the time people are tried in the media for, you know, you make a charge against somebody, um, uh, and, and, and people uh, ostracize them or, or blacklist them, and this, is, this happens all the time. Uh, but the media usurped the function of judge and jury, and I saw that happening. By the end of the day, they were uh, putting out all kinds of statements about, you know, very strong statements that Oswald did it. But if you listen, for example, th there's a, um, a phone conversation between LBJ and J. Edgar Hoover at 10.01 a.m., the day after, uh, and actually you can't listen to it because the tape disappeared, but there's a transcript. And Hoover was saying there's there's not enough evidence to, to this man was the assassin. He said the case is not very, very strong is the way he put it. And he was uh, talking about, um, you know, they claimed that very quickly they put out a story that Oswald went to Mexico City to try to get a visa to go to Cuba <clears throat> and he met with the Russians and the Cubans, and this was very suspicious. And I don't think he went there at all. I think he was impersonated. And in this phone call, Hoover tells Johnson, we have a problem in that we have a recording of the man's voice in Mexico, and we flew it up to Dallas, and the people interrogating Oswald uh, listened to the tape, and they realized it wasn't the same man, you know, so right there was a big hole in the official story, but you keep reading that Oswald went to Mexico City, you keep reading those stories, and he was a communist, Castro sympathizer, etc. There were people who were using him, I believe they wanted to start a, another attack on Cuba, which Kennedy had promised not to do after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. He, he said he would not invade Cuba anymore. Uh, you know, they invaded Cuba in the Bay of Pigs fiasco. But anyway, so I'm just mentioning a couple of things. The media went along with the propaganda that was spooned out by the government. Carl Bernstein of Woodward and Bernstein fame wrote a terrific piece called The CIA and the Media, which I'd recommend to your listeners. It's on the, on the internet for free. And he published it in Rolling Stone in 1977. And it was a long piece, very well researched on how many people in the media were CIA connected? And he said there were at least 400 people in the mainstream media at the in 77 who were either employees of the CIA or, or doing, you know, occasional work for the CIA or doing favors for the CIA. And, uh, you know, they were embedded with newspapers to make them credible. And he said the three biggest culprits were the New York Times, CBS, and Time Life. And it's no coincidence that those were the three biggest outlets blaming, you know, shaping the official story of the Kennedy assassination and supporting the Warren Commission, which Johnson formed a week after the assassination. And, and the Warren report is, is a sham. Uh, you know, it's a complete pack of lies. Uh, I mean, there's some facts in there, but they twist them around and very selective, et cetera. But I mean, um, the, the media were heavily involved with the CIA and, and a lot of people were, uh, had come from World War II and they were involved with military intelligence. The head of the publisher of Life magazine, which bought the Zapruder film and, and hid it away from the public, they, they ran some fr frame enlargements, very selective, but they wouldn't show the public this film. And why did they own this film? Why, did, why didn't the government seize the film? But the publisher, uh, C.D. Jackson, had come from military intelligence and he was uh, President Eisenhower's media advisor 
and he was an intelligence operative and he, he also was publisher of life magazine so you know a lot of these guys did double duty working for the government and for the so-called media and um so you know it's it's the media is kind of an arm of the government the, the mainstream media so the my book political truth goes into how that story came came into uh came to coalesce over the first few weeks and months and it's really been solidified the mainstream media have not done much independent reporting since then uh, despite all the wealth of documents that have come out and, and, uh, and witness reports and all kinds of things that uh, independent researchers have come up with the mainstream media the washington post and the new york times especially those are the outlets that i write about the most they just stick to the <clears throat> the official story as it was codified in 1964 and uh, they don't take cognizance of all the information that's come out since yeah um with uh red flags when it comes to oswald what were the red flags for you because a couple of the things that i thought of was the fact that he was 24 years old and somehow became i mean not only just assassinated the president as he was being claimed to have assassinated the president but he did so much stuff where he was able to dupe a whole commission where i go i'm 24 and there's no way in hell i could even do anything close to that type of thing and i'm not i'm not saying he's like way more educated than me and i'm not saying i'm an idiot or at any sort even though some people might I'd say that I am. I just think when you look at the age thing, I mean, is it the same scenario where if I went to war when I turned 18 and then I got out when I was in my 20s and then somehow I get picked up by a big CEO of a business, get rushed all the way up to the top of the business, given all the cars, given all the money, given all the women, given all the mansions that I want. And then one day police knock on my door and I'm being blamed for running the whole business and being incriminated. Is that not the same thing that we're seeing with Oswald? The fact that he has intelligence fingerprints all over his profile. Maybe he was an informant. Let's say he was an informant for the Central Intelligence Agency. But the aspect of all the things that were lined up that were getting pinned on him, I start going, this was someone that wasn't special, wasn't like outside of, he wasn't a James Bond type. He was just a person that they could use as a, a scapegoat, as a way to be like, we're going to put all of it on you and you're going to be the person that kills the president if we decide to do these things. And I think when you look at all the multiple, like the skull fragments, all the medical evidence, all the weird kind of stuff that everyone picks through like chicken bones, I think they're, they're called chokeholds as what I've been told. But I also think they're alternate plans. The fact that you have a one profile that's linking him to Cuba, and then you have another profile that's linking him to Russia. You have a bunch of runners running one race, but only one person gets first. So you're literally swaying with how the direction of the tides of the case go. If it starts going this way, you got this way out. If you got this way out, you got this way out. It's like having plan A and plan B. But I think they had multiple of these plans. And I think a lot of these things that people go, you can go searching into that for years and you'll get lost. I go, that's one of their alternate plans that didn't go to fruition, that didn't turn into the mainstream thing that they had. Because the one thing I always raised a question about besides Oswald was the Warren Commission. The fact that you had a, a specific committee designed to investigate the assassination of the president and you had people that were involved in it that were stepping down. I don't care how much you're getting paid. You're getting a job to investigate the assassination of John F. Kennedy, where you go, what would make you step down from getting that little gold star on your resume? And that's integrity or something that you didn't feel like you could go with because it was probably a lie. And that's what I kind of influenced into this case a little bit. And I think there's clear evidence to state that there's a lot of evidence to support that conclusion on things. Well. When you look into the history of the Warren Commission, it's a fascinating story of these very important men who were appointed, Alan Dulles, former head of the CIA, who was fired by Kennedy, shouldn't have been on the commission. Um, Gerald Ford, uh, up and coming congressman, uh, later became president. Um, Richard Russell, a very important senator, um, you know, important people, but they didn't actually do a lot. Most of the work at the commission was done by junior counsel who worked really hard. And a lot of the commissioners um, <clears throat> kind of dialed it in and didn't attend very many hearings. Uh, Dulles attended the most. He was very involved, but he, he was retired, you know, and, and he was very interested in keeping the truth from the commission. 
there's a good book by Donald Gibson I'd recommend on, on the formation and the, and the workings of the Warren Commission. But um, Oswald was a remarkable fellow, you know, 24 when you think uh, you're 24 and I remember when I was 24, you know, I mean, we hadn't done a lot of, uh, you know, he'd done some things, but the guy had a remarkable career when you think about it. He did join the Marines when he was uh, young, 18, uh, and uh, actually maybe a little earlier, but he was um, interested in the Marines for whatever reason. He had a brother in the service and uh, he, he um, but he got, he was involved in the Atsugi Air Force Base in Japan, which was a top secret Air Force Base that had the U-2 plane. And he had access to the U-2 plane and, and radar and things. And then he, then he supposedly defects to Russia. And uh, <clears throat> it, it's, it, there, there is evidence that he was trained in, in the Russian language at the Monterey School for Languages, which is a, a military installation in California. So they were grooming him as an agent. And here's a young guy who wasn't very well educated. He had dyslexia. He was very intelligent, but he, people thought he was not intelligent because he had dyslexia and his writing suffered from that, you know. Um, but um, when you listen to his interviews, he's, he's, he's sharp guy but he goes to russia he knows the language and the russians were suspicious of him they they kind of suspected he was a, an american spy which he was and they shuffled him off to a distant uh, place and then he he wanted to go back to america and uh, uh they were surveilling him in russia uh, the russians were but then he came back to america very easily allowed back in you know if he was a real defector they would have um investigated him thoroughly and um, uh, put restrictions on him, but he brought back a Russian wife and the, the FBI agent, James Hostie, who was assigned to the Oswalds in Dallas, thought that Marina Oswald was his main target. He thought she was probably a KGB agent. And her uh, uncle was an important intelligence uh, operative in Russia. And so she had some, uh, she, she was possibly an agent who was being infiltrated into the United States by marrying an American. And then they get connected with uh, George de Morenschild, who's a CIA man, became their babysitter in, in uh, Dallas. And he was a very right wing guy. And, uh, he, but he was connected with the white Russian community in Dallas, which, you know, is contrary to, if you're a communist, you're not mixed up with the white Russians who are anti-communist. And then um, de Morenschild, got a $300,000 payment in his bank account and uh, probably for services rendered. And then he left in the spring of 63 for Haiti, uh, another trouble spot. And he was, uh, his job was taken over by Ruth Payne, who's still alive, uh, the subject of a new documentary I'd recommend called The Assassination of Mrs. Payne by Max Good. It's streaming now, it just came out last week. Um, she was a CIA connected operative and she took Marina into her home and Mrs. Payne was fluent in Russian and uh, she got Oswald the job at the school book depository, et cetera. And so there was a plot underway and they were maneuvering Oswald in position, but I found out he reported to the Dallas FBI at least three times in November of 63, um, you know, by digging into the papers and other um, documents. I found out he, he reported to them uh, three times. What was he reporting about? He was probably reporting on the plot and he didn't know that he was the fall guy. And um, <clears throat> I studied a lot the formation of the motorcade route because that's really crucial to get the motorcade to go past the school book depository into the kill zone. Dealey Plaza is a perfect place for a crossfire. Well, it changed routes, didn't it? It was a sudden change. Well, uh, there's some dispute about that. I mean, it, it, some people think that because there was a, a map in one of the Dallas papers that didn't show the turn onto Elm Street. Um, but uh, previously, a couple of days before, another paper showed the correct route. But Secret Service regulations banned that kind of sharp turn because the car had to, you know, big car had to uh, slow down to go around the corner and it's dangerous to do that. And, and uh, it slowed to 11 miles an hour and the regulations were the car was never supposed to go below 25 miles an hour. So it was a sitting duck as it rolled down the hill, but they could have gone down Main Street without making that turn. And they, they could have built a little wooden ramp to go uh, across Main Street onto the freeway, 
but um, that route was planned uh, November 14th in, in the office of <clears throat> Eugene Locke, who was the head of the um, Texas Democratic Party. But I found out that Kenneth O'Donnell, who was Kennedy's chief of staff, in effect, was the main guy pushing for that uh, route, along with the Secret Service, who should have known better. And uh, <clears throat> I came to the conclusion that O'Donnell was an inside man for the plot. I mean, he kept popping up in all kinds of places. He was responsible for stealing Kennedy's body from the Parkland Hospital and a lot of uh, things that he was involved in were suspicious. And then Seymour Hirsch reported that uh, O'Donnell was going to be fired on Monday the 25th back in Washington because he had been embezzling money from uh, the, the campaign funds. And he was corrupt and he, he had turned against Kennedy, which is very interesting. Uh, you know, no, uh, nobody had ever fingered O'Donnell as a suspect before. But when you do a, 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 an assassination of a leader, you have to compromise his or her security. Like Indira Gandhi was killed by her bodyguards. You know, it's very typical. Even if you look at the play Macbeth, um, you know, they had to drug the bodyguards and uh, kill the bodyguards so that- Julius Caesar. Yeah, Julius Caesar, and he was surrounded by senators. And um, But the Secret Service were compromised. There were several, Vince Palomara, is, I think you've had him on your show. He's the expert on the Secret Service. He's done tremendous research. And he, he has five Secret Service agents who are in Dallas who he thinks were involved. And um, you need to compromise people like that. The car slowed down to a stop or a near stop right at the point of the headshot, and then it sped up again. And uh, <clears throat> I interviewed uh, Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was riding in the car with Linda Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson, two cars behind the Kennedy car. And he said the car, Kennedy car stopped during the shooting. He wondered why. And he said Secret Service men were piling out of the car. He thought there had been a bomb explosion in the car. But you don't see Secret Service men piling out of the car in the Zapruder film. You see Clint Hill running to the car, and that's it. One other agent started to go but he was called back by the the lead agent in the car which is suspicious too um they should have protected kennedy better and the the two agents in the front seat didn't do anything except the driver hit the brakes instead of the accelerator which he was supposed to do but anyway um oswald was a pawn in this very complex plot but when you mentioned they had different tracks which is true they were really you know the Kennedy was, I believe, killed because he was trying to have detente with the Russians and the Cubans. He was making overtures to Cuba to try to uh, get along with Castro, and Castro had a certain respect for Kennedy. But there were people in the government who really wanted to, just to invade Cuba and invade Russia, even uh, the USSR, and um, launch a first strike against the Soviets. And Kennedy was trying to stop all that, and, and the CIA was out of control. So these people had to get rid of Kennedy. They, they wanted an expanded Vietnam War. Kennedy had a few advisors in Vietnam, 16,000, and he was pulling people out. He already had pulled 1,000 people out. He'd ordered 1,000 people pulled out who were pulled out in December, and then they replaced them quickly. But Johnson uh, was committed to expanding the war. And two days after Kennedy was shot, <clears throat> Johnson had a secret meeting at the executive office building with um, Henry Cabot Lodge, the ambassador to Vietnam, and Secretary of State Rusk and, and uh, McNamara and other people. And they he issued the order to widen the war and go after the North Vietnamese. And uh, they put out the National Security Action Memorandum. It was all secret. The public wasn't told that they were secretly widening the war. and. <clears throat> Johnson ran on a peace platform in 64. He kept saying, I'm going to bring the troops home and end the war, and Goldwater is a warmonger, et cetera. And people believed him, but Johnson was just waiting to get reelected so he could expand the war. And he finally, at the peak, he had 535,000 troops there. And he knew the war was unwinnable, too. There are two tape recordings you can hear online between him and his mentor, Senator Richard Russell, a Warren Commission member. Uh, in, in the spring of 64, <clears throat> in May and June of 64, uh, where he was, Johnson was admitting the war couldn't be won. And Russell said, if if we get deeply involved, uh, it'll take 10 years and we'll lose 50,000 men, which is exactly what happened, you know, and millions of 
Asians were killed. But Johnson basically says, I'm powerless to stop it. Uh, it's because he was put in power to do that. That was the price of being in power, but he knew it was impossible. And that's what destroyed his presidency. And all the good things he did with the Great Society were um, hampered by the fact that the war was going on and draining our resources and causing him endless problems and causing civil unrest. But anyway, uh, one point I was going to make about other tracks, they had other possible places to kill Kennedy. In Chicago, November 2nd, there was a serious plot and, and Kennedy was <clears throat> coming to Chicago for the Army-Navy football game. and. He had a motorcade similar to the one in Dallas going through a kind of industrial area with tall buildings and um, <clears throat> before his car was going to go on the freeway and they had a patsy lined up and they caught two of the four uh, uh, assassins and uh, there were Cubans involved and they caught some of them and <clears throat> then they covered it up and the agent who tried to tell the Warren Commission about this Abraham Bolden was framed on a counterfeiting charge that was false and he was put in prison for six years and for trying to tell the Warren Commission the truth he was finally pardoned recently by Biden it took forever but it's great that he got pardoned but a very brave man the first black agent on the, on the White House Secret Service detail and there was also there were also plots that November gets Kennedy in Tampa and Miami that could have occurred depending on the circumstances. But Dallas was a, a ideal place because Johnson could control the law enforcement and legal community in Dallas because he was, you know, a Texan and he had a network of people there. Isn't also because Texan or uh, just Texas in general is like it's 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 kind of like it's it, it, it's what is it? it's the Lone Star State. So it's got like this kind of like different regulation, I would say, when it comes to the other fifth or the other 49 states. Like there's a reason like when they the president was killed, um, that the autopsy has to be done in Texas. That's Texas law. And it wasn't. They wanted to move the body out somewhere. So there's a lot of stuff about Texas. It just seems like it would be easier to be able to manipulate the law if you were trying to pull off an assassination temp compared to the other 49 states. Yeah. Yeah. I studied the. Um the body theft, um, <clears throat> Kennedy's body was allegedly going to be removed from Parkland Hospital. Uh, the, as you say, the law was if there's a homicide in Dallas, uh, the medical examiner, Dr. Earl Rose, was supposed to do the autopsy. And he did exemplary autopsies on Oswald and Officer Tippett, uh, really thorough and very good. And if he had done the Kennedy autopsy, we would have not had some of the problems that have occurred because the body was altered when it got to uh, Washington. Uh, that's another big uh, story. But um, I, I believe, I, I think it's possible that the coffin at Parkland was empty and they had a, a, a nearly violent fight over the coffin. This was one of the things that when I was younger, I, when I read that, I, it was a big red flag for me that they were taking the coffin out through the hallway and Dr. Rose was trying to stop them saying, they were breaking the law, which they were. And it got into a physical confrontation. They shoved him up against the wall and they showed guns and the you know, Secret Service had guns and the Dallas police were involved in helping steal the coffin. And But um, they had to get some kind of official approval. So they there was a, a, a justice of the peace there named Theron Ward. And I interviewed Henry Wade, who is the DA of Dallas, uh, got a really good interview with him. He's the Wade in Roe versus Wade, for for one thing. But um, he was an old friend of Johnson, and he had gone to uh, University of Texas with Governor Connolly, et cetera, and, and uh, they all knew each other. But anyway, Wade told me it was his responsibility for letting the body go. Uh, Ward called him and said, you know, what should I do? They, they want to remove the body. And, and, and Wade said, OK, let him do it. And he kind of laughed to me. He said, well, you know, what would be the worst thing that would happen? A hundred dollar fine for taking the body out of Texas. I mean, he kind of brushed it off. But um, I think the fact that they were willing to have a gunfight in the hallway with Mrs. Kennedy standing there could have been that the coffin was empty. And if that had been found, that would have blown the whole plot. But I found a document, a rather obscure document. It's actually in the Warren volumes. Um, the administrator of Parkland Hospital <clears throat> filed a report on his activities. And he said that during that period there, um, 
the Secret Service came to him and said they wanted to remove the Johnsons from the hospital by a secret uh, exit. Did they, did they have a secret exit? And he said, yeah, from the emergency room, you could go into a tunnel they would take you out to the back of the hospital and you could sneak out of the hospital. So there was a tunnel. They could have removed Kennedy's body through the tunnel. And I just think that's interesting. But when the body got to Washington, uh, there was a pre-autopsy autopsy. autopsy. Uh, Douglas Horn wrote a series of five books and he got witnesses to the autopsy, the pre-autopsy autopsy, which means they brought in the body and they, they tampered with it. and. Uh, one one of the autopsy doctors, Humes, and another doctor were seen uh, smashing. Well, they're not sure Boswell was at this, but Humes was there and some other doctor. But they were smashing Kennedy's head. The wound in the uh, back of the head was seen by the doctors and nurses at Parkland. They all said he had a big wound in the back of his head. That's where the bullet blew out his brains in the back of his head. But there was not that huge wound on the top of his head and the side of the head that, uh, let's see which side, <laughs> yeah, the side, um, th that you see on the Zapruder film. And that that wound was made at Parkland. They, they uh, crudely for about 10 minutes smashed his head with a hammer and took out evidence of bullets. And, and when they had the autopsy, the doctors were claiming that, you know, they couldn't find bullets in the body, which was very odd. They later claimed they found a bullet at Parkland, but it was in pristine condition. It was probably planted. But in other words, they altered the body and removed the bullets. Uh, and then the Warren, uh, the um, Zapruder film and, and Horn proved this. These are things that I had trouble believing for a long time, but these diligent researchers found the evidence. David Lifton wrote an important book called Best Evidence in which he proved that the body was altered. And <clears throat> um, they also, um, uh, well, there are all kinds of things that went on in the autopsy that were deceitful and uh, prove, they tried to prove that the shots all came from behind. But one of the shots hit Kennedy in the temple. There was another wound around here at the top of the hairline, but the sh he was hit in the temple and that's the wound that probably blew out the back of his head. And I found uh, a, a document, that FBI document, that really is a smoking gun that disproves the Warren report, that A.H. Belmont, who is a high official in the FBI who was in charge of the investigation, on the night of November 22nd, wrote a memo and said that uh, there was a bullet lodged behind the president's right ear, and we are in the process of obtaining that. And that bullet was never entered into evidence. And that's that's evidence of, you know, it contradicts the Warren report. There was no bullet officially removed from his head. And, and but there were witnesses, including Secret Service agents and civilians who saw him hit in the right temple. So uh, a lot of chicanery went around and, and these, you know, so they were altering the story. It's a, it's a kind of fake news situation. We now call it fake news they were constructing a whole alternate reality and selling it to the public. Um, and, you know, I went through again, the issues of the New York Times, Washington Post and Time Magazine, Newsweek and many other publications for my book, Political Truth and examined how the media constructed this false account. But as I say, for the first couple of weeks, there were conflicting stories like um, a couple of those outlets said that there was, um, uh, the bullet wound in the back, in his back, which supposedly the Warren Commission said was in his neck and went out through his throat. Well, the Dallas uh, doctors said on the day of the assassination, he was shot in the front from the front and the fir first bullet hit him in the, in the throat. And then they said it, he took one to the head and they pointed like this as well too. Yeah, yeah, the, the press secretary pointed to the temple actually. And, uh, but the shot from the be behind was allegedly going through the body and into Connolly, which was called the magic bullet that the Warren Commission devised to account for the timing of the shots. Otherwise it wouldn't work. <clears throat> Otherwise you couldn't have one shooter, but um, the Washington Post and, and, and other papers said that in December of 63, that there was a bullet, uh, at the hole, there was a bullet hole in his shoulder blade at autopsy and they put their finger in the bu bullet hole and it, the finger only went in a little bit and they didn't find a bullet. 
it didn't go through the body, you know, that contradicts the Warren report. So there's another loose end. There are many of those loose ends in the papers the first few weeks before the story was really codified in the media. So where do we get to the aspect of with Oswald, for instance, being there? Was he set up by the pains? I know I haven't really talked deeply about the pains a lot i've heard um just with the there's ease of access of getting his rifle in some parts uh, mostly because he was staying there with them um i just i i'm very i'm very clueless on the pains but also at the same time when it comes to oswald how do we get to the point where there was a lot of incriminating stuff on him there how do they know his location how do they get all i mean they had tabs on him for four years they were tapping his phones and stuff but a week before the assassination attempt they dropped the threat thing on him they dropped the watch on him so i start going but they knew like did they have a schedule how would they get a schedule is that because of the pains i mean would they possibly know yeah that's part of it more and sheld more and sheldon and ruth Payne and her husband michael Payne. <clears throat> part of their job would be to keep tabs on him. He was, Oswald was staying in a rooming house in Dallas. He wasn't living with the pains, but he would come out on weekends and they, had, they knew where he was for one thing. And But the Dallas police knew where he was and the military intelligence people knew where he was. They had files on him. The Dallas police had, as a lot of police departments did, kind of a, a red squad or, you know, an a investigative unit that kept tabs on dissidents in town. And uh, we know that because, uh, for example, one of my revelations in my Tippett book, <clears throat> Into the Nightmare, which is about two thirds of it is on the Tippett case and then the other third on the Kennedy case. Uh, I think the Tippett case was described as the Rosetta Stone of the assassination by David Bellin, who was a defender of the Warren Commission. But I think it, it is in a way, but not in the way that he claims. I think it, it helps disprove that Oswald did it. Uh, but in, in the case of uh, the Tippett murder, um, the, uh, let's see, where was I going with that? We were just talking about. Uh, well, we we're talking about how Oswald got set up into this scenario. But I, and if I, if I I'll, I'll give you another aspect of things. I've, when I talked to Dale, he mentioned um, this idea that there was an interaction between um, Oswald and Tippett before that would premeditate this type of thing. Now, I've heard people say that that's not true, but much like you mentioned about the imposter in Mexico, I kind of link this in with what I know from MK Ultra with my college of just papers on it. And that was that there was one experiment that I point out that kind of, it's not really brainwashing, it's not mind control, but it's, look at this hand while the other hand's doing something else. And there's an account of a person that's sitting in a room and each day, I think he was in there for a total of 28 days. Uh, a nurse would come up, but it would be a, a, a guy nurse, but his, he'd be wearing a mask and he'd be wearing a hat. So you can only really see his eyes, but he would come in and drop a tray of food. Now, each day, the person from day one to day 28 that was dropping off the food was a different person, but the, the guy who was getting the food couldn't tell because they were all the same height and weight, but he couldn't see enough of their face to be able to detect if it was a different person or not. Where I go, if you're setting up imposters, would it be easy to say, hey, your name is Lee Harvey Oswald, go around town and cause chaos or stand at this corner so people can say that they did see you here. And that's what, what the diner thing where he said, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. diner. I, I I don't necessarily believe that story. There was a report that a waitress said she saw them two days before, in the same diner, Tippett and Oswald, and they kind of looked at each other knowingly. But I'm not. You know, it's just one witness. I'm not sure that happened or not. But I the point I was going to make was the Dallas police knew where Oswald was at the time of the assassination. They you know, the official story was they didn't know who Oswald was until. 2 10 p.m when they they arrested him at the theater at 152 uh an hour and 22 minutes after the assassination and uh, he had two sets of identification in his wallet they claimed and they they didn't uh identify until they got him to the police station but what i found out <clears throat> in my tippet research i interviewed tippet's father edgar lee tippet who had never been interviewed except once by the fbi and a very uh candid uh, nice old man, uh, very lucid. Uh, and he said that um, Mrs. Tippett, he visited her soon after the killing of his son. And she said a Dallas policeman had come to her and explained that he and J.D. Tippett were assigned by the Dallas police to track down Oswald right after the assassination. 
And I later identified that policeman as uh, William Mensel, who was the guy actually assigned to the district where the Tippett murder took place. Tippett was assigned to a, a district several miles away. So what was he doing in that area? But according to Mrs. Tippett, who got it from Mensel, they were both told by the Dallas police to go and track down Oswald in the suburb of Oak Cliff, where he lived. <clears throat> and and the, so somehow the police, first of all, they knew he lived in Oak Cliff and, and they knew that he was going there. So they were sent there. They were looking for him in their different squad cars. And Tippett was behaving oddly. He was he stopped a car and looked in the back and then he didn't see anybody and he took off and he, he ran into a uh, uh, record store on Jefferson Boulevard, not far from where he was shot and made a phone call and he stood there and apparently he didn't say anything either. He didn't get anybody on the phone or maybe he got some message and he hung up the phone and ran out and, you know, he was in a, a frenzy kind of running around looking for Oswald. And then he, um, he winds up getting shot. But in the meantime, Mensel told Mrs. Tippett that he had a car crash. He said, uh, I had a car accident. I didn't get to the place where JD was shot. And I feel terrible about it because if I'd gotten there first, I would have been shot. And I've, I looked in the records and Mensel claimed he was having lunch at a cafeteria nearby, which doesn't make any sense. But like in the middle of, you know, when the president is shot, all the policemen in Dallas were running around and here's a guy who claimed he was having lunch at a cafeteria. And, uh, but I, I found another record that he was, uh, he went to the scene of a car crash about two blocks from the Tippett murder. Right around that time, there was a car crash and he was sent to it and he, he arrived and he spent four minutes there and left. And, you know, if you're a policeman and you come upon a car crash, you can't write it up in four minutes, no matter how minor the car crash is. So I think that was a cover for him having some kind of accident, but he didn't make it to the scene. JD makes it to the scene and I believe he ran into an ambush. He was shot uh with the complicity of the dallas police there were there was a police car in the alleyway right where he stopped between there were two houses and he, he blocked the driveway there and in the alleyway there was a police car seen by a, a woman across the street and somebody came from the police car and shot tippet and um then walked up to him and shot him again in the head just to make sure he was dead and then went back to the police car and the car backed up through the alley and went back toward jefferson boulevard and so there were at least two people involved in that. And Mrs. Aquila Clemens, who was a, a black woman who was a domestic working half a block away was uh, a very good witness. And she said two men were involved in the shooting and she described them on film to Mark Lane and Emil D'Antonio for their film Rush to Judgment. You can see that on YouTube. And she was never seen again after that. And she was threatened by the police. Yeah. Um, when I Okay, so about you saying Dallas police killed Tippett? I believe so. And there, I, I, you know, it was really hard investigating the scene of the Tippett murder because uh, JD, uh, Jim Lavelle, who was the head detective in the Tippett case, also interrogated Oswald. He's the guy in the white suit who's handcuffed to Oswald when Oswald was shot. People will remember that image. Lavelle was a very interesting interview. He was, he seemed fairly candid. He covered up some things, but he, he, you could really get answers out of him. And he said that Captain Will Fritz, the head of homicide, told him that night, um, we don't really have a case on Oswald for killing Kennedy, so make sure you get a case on him for killing Tippett. And they charged him with uh, both murders, but they only arraigned him on the murder of Tippett. They didn't never arraigned him on the murder of Kennedy, which is remarkable. And I said to Lavelle, why, why did you think you had a better case on the Tippett murder? He said, well, we had witnesses. And actually, if you look at the witnesses, it's very a mess because there were about 10 people who saw parts of the shooting or parts of the aftermath of the shooting where somebody was running away. And they disagree considerably. Some people said Oswald did it. Some people said two men did it. Um, Mrs. Clemens said there was a short, stocky guy who did the shooting, and then there was a tall, skinny guy across the street, and they were working in unison. And somebody else said uh, the, the shooter drove away in a car, and <clears throat> a different car. And then Mrs. Holland across the street said they, they left in a police car. 
And uh, there were two ladies who lived at the corner and they said they, they heard the shots, they went outside and there were policemen already there, which is remarkable because the official story is the police didn't show up for about nine minutes, I believe. And uh, so there were policemen already there. And, um, but it's like Rashomon, the Japanese film, you know, the conflicting witnesses. And one thing I found, and Jerry Rose, who was a researcher, first kind of made this uh, observation that it, he thought the Tippett murder scene was staged by Jack Ruby to some extent. Ruby was involved in the plot be before he was uh, assigned to kill Oswald. He tried to tell that to Earl Warren, who wouldn't listen to him, that he was involved in the plot. But a lot of the witnesses at the, at the Oswald, uh, at the Tippett shooting scene were friends of Jack Ruby or associates of him, which is odd. And, uh, but some of them, a couple of them uh, gave accounts that contradicted the, the official version uh, in terms of time. For example, the, the Warren Commission claimed the shooting took place at 1.15, but it, it really took place at around 1.08 or 1.09. And that's a crucial difference because Oswald could not have walked from his rooming house to the scene of the crime at, uh, uh, in eight minutes. He was seen at one o'clock standing outside his rooming house. So I, I interviewed T.F. Boley who came at 1.10 and saw Tippett was already on the ground uh, dead and he went over to Tippett. And so that, that shoots down the Warren Commission version. Uh, so, but a lot of the, uh, several of the witnesses who, who said Oswald did it um, said so later under duress the closest witness, Domingo Benavides, refused to identify Oswald as a shooter, so they didn't even bring him for a lineup. And then uh, they had a lineup in which, um, you know, they had several guys in suits, and then they had Oswald, who was all disheveled and bloody and everything, and it was obvious who they wanted people to pick. And the woman uh, who is their star witness, uh, Helen Markham, <clears throat> uh, kept passing out during, during the lineup and they were kind of telling her who to pick, you know, and, uh, but anyway, uh, some of the, another witness um, refused to identify Oswald and he was shot in the head a, a couple months later. And then he said, oh yeah, it was Oswald, you know. And then there was Benavides who wouldn't identify Oswald in 63, was interviewed by CBS four years later and he identified Oswald. And in the meantime, his brother was killed uh, in a, shooting. So um, witnesses were intimidated into identifying Oswald. And, and so it is a very complicated scene. It took me a long time to try to figure it out. It's, it's, it's not totally, not totally clear what happened. I don't want to interrupt. I got so many questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, when it, do you know the squad car numbers of the two officers, Tibbet and the other one that was, um, do you know the exact numbers of those? Because Gary Hill mentioned when I talked to him on um, his episode, he talked about how there was a squad car that pulled out in front of oswald's apartment that he was renting and just honked and drove off and i go was that the other officer yeah that's a good question uh, mrs um uh, the um the housekeeper at oswald's rooming house identified uh the uh car outside she thought it was car 10 which was uh tippet's car was car 10 uh, but she she was not clear um but well, actually I'm, I'm sorry i'm looking it up this is uh Erlene roberts she thought it was 207 but tippet's car was 10. i don't know offhand mensel's car number but um some people think tippet pulled up and honked somebody some police car pulled up and honked outside rooming, his rooming house while he was in there allegedly getting the gun although john armstrong proved that oswald didn't own any weapons uh, but he was in his rooming house briefly before leaving, but a car pulled up for whatever reason. Some people think they they drove Oswald to the theater. He was seen at the theater a lot earlier than he was officially uh, said to be there. Uh, he was seen at the theater by the, one of the guys who worked there, like right around one o'clock, which was, um, uh, you know, before Tippett was shot, for example. Well, if Tippett was shot at 103 or 106, I think. Well, 108 or 109, I think is the closest. He, Tippett made a call to the police radio at 108. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I interviewed a couple of D Dallas uh, researchers who really uh, studied the Tippett case a lot. And one of them thought it was 108, 109 was the other one who, uh, when he was killed. Um, there, there was a lady across the street 
thought he was killer 106 and mrs markham who was the star warren commission witness said it was 106 but um he was killed soon after one o'clock um but uh, the police car story has never been totally explicated what was going on with that but um mensel was driving around uh Dallas and uh, Tippett was driving around Dallas, you know, and uh, Oak Cliff, the suburb is where the shooting took place. So there, why would the police shoot Tippett? Uh, that's, you know, I tried to figure out motives. One is possibly very simple. Um, when Oswald, when, when a policeman is shot, you know, the police department drops everything and runs to the scene of that. That's typical. And I asked Lavelle about that. I said, uh, I, I detected on the police radio, they, they all seemed very kind of calm when Kennedy was shot. And then when they said an officer is shot, everybody gets kind of hysterical and, and talks fast and, and the, a lot of calls coming in fast. And he said, that's true. And he said that that takes precedence over everything, even the shooting of the president. And I said, how did you regard the shooting of the president? And he, he made a little kind of evil laugh and he said, uh, well, as the old saying goes, it wasn't any, it wasn't no different from a South Dallas N-word shooting. He used the N-word. That's how they regarded the Kennedy murder as a South Dallas N-word shooting. That's the contempt they had for Kennedy. Uh, but that, so all these police cars converged on Oak Cliff, dozens and dozens of them, and it, it drained resources from Dealey Plaza where they should have been investigating the Kennedy murder, that could be a reason enough. And also to make sure they captured the Patsy, which they did. And I think Oswald was supposed to be killed either by Tippett and Mensel or in the uh, theater was a backup plan, but Oswald survived in the theater by saying, I'm not resisting arrest, I'm not resisting arrest. And he, they dragged him out. Dwight McDonald, the literary critic referred to the miraculous survival of Oswald for 48 hours in the hands of the Dallas police. <clears throat> and then they had to get Jack Ruby to kill him in the police station. But uh, another reason could have been that Tippett was involved in the assassination plot in some way. I studied the possibility that Tippett may have been one of the shooters in Dealey Plaza. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, it, it is hard to prove, but there's some circumstantial evidence there's a photo of the grassy knoll, the retaining wall that shows a man in a policeman's uniform firing a weapon uh, at, the, at the end of the retaining wall, very close to the presidential car. And other people saw a policeman and there's several, there are seven different photographs showing uh, a person in a, in a dark policeman's uniform in, a, in that position. So Tippett could have been, the, one of the grassy knoll shooters, there is another shooter behind the fence. Do you think it could have been Tibbet or it could have been the other officer and he was making up the car accident because that's what he did? It only took him a couple of minutes to fire those shots at Kennedy. Or could it be the ones that shot the officers that shot Tippett? Could it be that maybe one just impersonating police officers have a squad car and everything? And then they realize that they didn't get caught doing any of that stuff. And if they're blaming Oswald, Oswald left the scene. They had a rambler and everything, an impersonation of Oswald to get this shot of this person driving off in this car. But now you have you well, you have witness encounters of like a bus incident, but also if this if Oswald knew he was getting set up and they're saying he's going to his apartment to go get his point thirty eight or whatever you want to say, and then that's the gun that kills Tibbet. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff where it's like how fucking close is everything? Like, is everything like right next door? Like, I, 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 for me, I have to walk and it takes me like five minutes and I'm in reasonably good shape to be able to walk a certain direction. But they're like having this person, like, is he the fastest? Like, is he Usain Bolt, like running through everything? I, I walked it, the route that Oswald was supposed to walk from his rooming house to the Tippett scene. It takes at least 10 or 15 minutes, even at a fast pace, uh, unless you're running. And nobody said they saw him running uh, or even saw him at all. But um, one reason to suspect Tippett in the Grassy Knoll incident was, uh, for a long time, I was wondering why there weren't any recent pictures of Tippett in the Warren Report. There are two photos of him, one from 1952 and one from 57. <clears throat> and he looked a lot different when he was shot. He looked a lot older. And I finally found at the Sixth Floor Museum, they had a display, they had a photo of him in 1962 and he looked a lot older, but he had a very distinctive hairline that had kind of a notch in it. If you look at pictures of him, there was kind of an odd notch. And then when you look at the uh, blow-ups of the picture of uh, 
the shooter on the grassy knoll, that person had a notch in his hairline that was exactly like Tibbetts. So that, that may indicate something. Uh, but the, John Armstrong, who's another good researcher, he, he did a, a very exhaustive book on um, Oswald and tremendous research. And like he proved that Oswald didn't own a rifle or pistol, but um, he's done more research. I'm glad, you know, when I did my Tippett book, I wanted to prompt other people to research Tippett because it's an under-researched area. That's why I chose it. And Darryl, Dale Myers's book, in my mind, is the Warren Report of the Tippett case. He brings up contrary evidence to um, what the Warren Commission says, and then he dismisses it basically in the back. In the footnotes of his book, he'll mention things like I've been telling you, and then some of them. And um, he doesn't mention the Edgar Tippett story because he never interviewed Edgar Tippett, for example. And uh, well, I think I pulled up your notes on air um, with him and was saying all these things. I was like, what type of person like if you're shooting Tippett and then you turn around and you come back for a headshot? And he was like, that's not what happened, is that he was falling as he was getting shot. And as he was falling, these bullets were hitting him and one hit him in the head. It wasn't like a assassination, like or execution, like they say, which I mean, I don't know. Like I, I like I said, I don't have a like, super huge bias or anything. I'm really just trying to sort out the information for myself. And it, whether they're agree, whether you agree with the Warren Commission report or not, the amount of evidence or the amount of research that people go in their separate directions, whether they agree with it or don't agree with it. And then there's also a dismissal of evidence as well, too, which I'm not a fan of. But when people come together, with like a, it might be a story or whatever when they have a lot of information i'm just like i don't know whether this person actually believes this like i can't believe the magic bullet i just can't but when it comes to the tippet death i definitely think that that was a hundred percent a ploy to get someone or incriminate someone just because there there was no besides seeing him on like drinking a coke on the second floor of the book depository building there's really no a clear thing he was the only one that left i guess i mean people well, left that, that isn't that. even true you know they that's they claim that, that there was a roll call and he was the only one who didn't answer but actually a whole bunch of people drifted away so that was another one of their false stories but yeah he was seen in the second floor lunchroom which is where he said he was at the time of the shooting some people think he was standing on the steps outside but he was not nobody as Lavelle indicated to me they had no witnesses who saw him in the window there was one guy they claimed was a witness but his story doesn't make sense and, and he had poor eyesight uh so there they had really no clear evidence that oswald was in the sixth floor window but um oh, i was going to mention john armstrong he has a theory that the two people in the police car who killed tippett were um uh, captain westbrook who was the head of personnel who was in civilian clothes and uh uh croy who was uh, uh croy was a, a reserve policeman who was on duty that day and uh, uh croy was uh, early on the scene very early on the scene of the tippet killing and he also had a false story about how he was having lunch you know, again at a, some restaurant nearby and then he he claimed he went to see his wife uh, and had lunch with her at, um, uh, at, at a restaurant where Tippett was um, a security guard, which it, the story doesn't make sense in the middle of, you know, the hunt for the assassin, you wouldn't go and have leisurely lunch. But so Armstrong thinks Croy and Westbrook were involved and Westbrook helped plant some of the evidence. Like there was, there was a wallet that supposedly Oswald dropped at the scene of the Tippett murder, which is preposterous. You know, if you're the a shooter, you wouldn't drop your wallet at the scene. And um, there were several different wallets that they produced that Oswald allegedly had. But anyway, Armstrong has, has pursued this uh, line. And I think there's some evidence that he's come up with that is suggestive of Westbrook and Croy. Uh, but he doesn't, he thinks Oswald shot Tippett and I disagree with him on that. Um, and I believe there were two Oswalds. That's what Armstrong proves in his book. I mean, I make a point in, in um, <clears throat> political truth that there are a whole lot of things that were very strange about the case that if we had known on November 22nd, we'd have a very different view of this. For example, the autopsy was faked. Uh, that would have shocked everybody and, and caused complete suspicion about the official story. But another was that there were two Oswalds. There were two people. The other uh, Oswald. Yeah, there, there was a, 
uh, Gary, know, Gary it, Hill has a whole site called the other Oswald. He explained the whole Mexico fiasco thing and all these lookalike scenarios, which is why I bring up the MK ultra thing. Yeah, there was, I mean, it's common in spycraft to have more than one person with, with a name and identity, because it, for one thing, it gives plausible deniability if so-and-so is caught in a certain city doing something, you'd say, well, he was in Dayton, Ohio at the time, you know, and so it's not that unusual, but there were, uh, uh, Armstrong proves, and uh, uh, he's not the first person who said this, but he, he spent 10 years really researching this, that um, there were sightings of Oswald in two different places at the same time, you know, he was supposed to be in Mexico and he was supposed to be in Texas at the same time. And uh, quite a lot of those incidents. And uh, so there was an impersonator going around. The only, I, I, I depart with him on some cases, he seems to be really sure which Oswald was which uh, uh, on every occasion. I'm not sure you can really tell, but he's done some terrific research and, and it really shoots down the story. But could you imagine on November 22nd, if they had said, well, there are two guys uh, claiming to be Oswald, and we're not sure which one we have. And one of them went to Russia, and the other didn't. And one of them was born in um, uh, Europe, and the other was was an American. You know, uh, that would have blown people's minds. There were, there were quite a lot of things like this about the case that are they're very strange. But it's a very complicated plot. And the more you get into it, the more you find more people had to have been aware of it and been involved in it one way or another, whether beforehand or in the cover up. Do you think when you look at like um, there's that interview, I forgot what, who was the person that did it, but it was Marina Oswald and she was on television and they were talking about um, the evidence and finding the rifle and then like her own statements and she just stopped them and goes, no, 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 I did not say that you are, you are wrongly, you're misinformed. And it was like, that's always a narrative that they found Oswald's rifle in the book depository building. And then I mean, I guess she was either like I've heard Jim say that she might have been muscled into answering that. But then I've also heard him say, like, no, it wasn't his rifle at all. Um, they were just, you know, you're locked in interrogation for a long time. Eventually, you just get muscled into saying yes to something just to get out of that room. And it makes it a big like a huge issue. And I mean, there's clear things, especially even with like um, the movie, um, the theater that he was caught in, like. They said that he didn't pay for a ticket, man. The man was caught with rolled up $1 bills and also had $1 bills all lined up in his apartment dresser as well, too, where it's like, if you're really not trying to raise red flags, are you going to sneak into a movie theater? Like, did you, did you, did you pay for a ticket? I know that's where spies meet. You have half a ticket and you try and match it up and see who your connection is. He had half of a dollar bill in his pocket, which is another way spies connect as they they show each other the half of the bill. He only had $13.49 on him, which uh, would, would hardly be enough to get away. It's possible, but um, well, uh, there were so many loose ends about the thing, but um, uh, you know, Oswald was a very mysterious figure and, and a lot of lies were told about him and the public was confused by many of these stories. And uh, you know, it was, uh, one thing I do in political truth is try to trace why the public is so divided today. We live in a country in which half the people believe one version of reality and half believe the other and half believe a fantasy world. And, and uh, a lot of this, I think, started with the Kennedy assassination. Uh, the, the general feeling is that it was the Vietnam War that started causing cynicism and distrust of the government. When I was a kid, we believed the government. We were naive. And, if the president said something, we tended to believe it. I was shocked when Eisenhower was caught lying about the U-2 flights in 1960. We were shocked the president told a lie. Well, today, uh, at least during the Trump period, we were shocked when the president told the truth. You know, it's gotten so far the opposite direction. Of course, presidents have lied way back to the beginning of our country, but we were pretty naive and trusting. But um, the Vietnam War definitely made a lot of people not believe in the government because we were systematically lied to about the war. But I, I think that it began with the assassination in 63, which helped cause the Vietnam War. You know, two days afterwards, Johnson widened the war secretly, and we didn't know that. And But um, even the first uh, Gallup poll about a week after the assassination showed that uh, most people didn't believe that one man had done it. And Gallup polls over the years have been pretty consistent that 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the public doesn't believe the one man, the lone gunman theory. 
and uh, sometimes people think Oswald did it with with uh, other people, and some people think Oswald didn't do it at all. I don't think Oswald did it at all, but um, the, the head of the Gallup organization said a few years ago that consistently about 75% think that uh, they don't believe the official story, and it's a little less today, but you know, that's, that's what bred this complete lack of trust in the government. And in some ways, lack of trust in the government is a good thing, but it's gone way too far, you know, to the point where people believe fantasies. And Watergate exacerbated that because we found out they lied to us and there was a real conspiracy that people couldn't deny there was a conspiracy in that case. And, but the media put out a kind of false version of what happened there. I think that the Woodward Bernstein story is sort of a myth these two young reporters brought down the president. It was really a CIA plot to bring down Nixon. They were involved in a power struggle. And Woodward is an Office of Naval Intelligence agent. He was then, and he probably still is. And he had a lot of intelligence sources to help bring down Nixon. But that, you know, all these things helped cause the public to not believe the government. And then you had Iran-Contra, and you had all kinds of other problems. And, <clears throat> and then you had two false wars, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan and the 2000 election being stolen. And you know, no wonder people don't believe the government. I, I can give you a whole list of just recent stuff of tell you why I don't trust the government. I, I think government's needed, but I also think you have a and I, I always mention this is that the day that Kennedy was killed is a plot point of when you got to see them try and cover up something and they did get away with it. Whether or not you say this, it's been so long now, there could be researchers and evidence come out now, but nobody paid the bill. And I, we don't know if they're ever going to pay the bill. We can figure out who finally did it, but are they still alive? There's those types of things. But if you look at like later down the road, 1975, where you talk about Operation Midnight Climax, you look at this place where the government's drugging people and just to spark up hate against the anti-hippie movement because all these hippies didn't want us to go into war. Next thing you know, you have all these people going crazy, drugging random people with LSD, which leads into like the same person who – freaking interview jack ruby before his court date before he starts having these hallucinations and visions of seeing jews burning in the street this is this is crazy stuff it sounds nuts that same person is the same person who interviewed and was the therapist for charles manson and then tom o'neill wrote a book about it saying that the place that charles manson was getting his drugs was a cia op place yeah that was a good book chaos and and he was talking about mk ultra yeah <clears throat> which um my, my friend Errol Morris, who's a great documentary filmmaker, called me when he was planning a film on MK Ultra, and he was wondering, we talked at length about, how do you make a film about that? Because they destroyed most of the documents in the 70s when the program came out. That was a program to try to program an assassination, try to try to uh, use LS, LSD and other things to have a, a brainwashed assassin in the 50s. And uh, the movie The Manchurian Candidate deals with that. It, 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 places the blame on the on, uh, communist Chinese, but it's kind of a displaced version of what we were actually doing, but they destroyed most of the documents. But uh, what Errol wound up doing was he made a film called Wormwood, which is very good, a four hour film. And <clears throat> he dramatized things to kind of explain what probably happened in, in the midst of what we know happened. But there was a man whose father uh, allegedly committed suicide, jumped out of a hotel. He was a professor and he was supposedly on LSD. And, and the son thinks the father was pushed out the window because he was going to reveal that the US government used nerve gas during the Korean War. And so that becomes the thread in, in the film Wormwood. But again, you know, how do you reconstruct things when they destroy a lot of evidence as they have in the Kennedy case? And they've, and a lot of documents are still uh, classified. You know, Trump said he was going to release all the remaining classified documents. And a day or two before, the FBI and the CIA got to him and persuaded him not to release some of the documents. And then Biden was supposed to release them, and he didn't do it. So, I mean, why are they covering up documents after all these years? To the Wormwood documentary, when the, when the person that allegedly committed suicide or coming out of a window on LSD, how did they fall? Because the way that cops detect if it's a suicide or a murder is the direction. If you nobody commits suicide and lands head first, it's impossible. Your body tries to naturally turn it to protect your head. And that's how they that's how they're able to depict between a suicide and a murder. That's how most of the mafia investigations um, were solved. If someone got thrown off of a roof or not, as if they hit head first. Hmm. 
I didn't, that I didn't know. I mean, the window was broken, et cetera, and they go into that in the film and he recreates it, et cetera. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the JFK Records Act was passed as a result of the film JFK that Oliver Stone made, which was attacked. I mean, it was very popular. The public loved it and it's a terrific film, but it was attacked mercilessly by the mainstream media as a fabrication. But in fact, I'd say it's very accurate film in portraying an alternate view of the assassination. Uh, it's based on, uh, you know, well-documented evidence and, and reports and uh, interviews and things. And Stone published a, a book, uh, uh, you know, with all the uh, footnotes and everything of the script. He, he, he wished he had done it earlier. He said he should have had the book out before the film came out or right at the same time. He waited a few months when he did Nixon, he, he learned his lesson. He put a book out like right away, you know, uh, everything in Nixon was well documented and his, the new film Destiny Betrayed, which is a very good film. The two hour and the four hour one. Yeah, There's the revisited. four hour version is, is I've terrific. I've seen them, I've seen them both probably hundreds of times. I analyzed the four hour one. I would do like cardio sessions on the weekends. I mean, for a couple months straight, I was watching it over and over and over and over because there's so much information. You're picking up little bits here and little bits there. And you're just like, there's always something new you can learn about. Yeah, the two hour version moves real fast and it's hard to assimilate all of it. I I mean, I know a lot about it, but there are things that I, you know, I was processing one thing and something else came along. And but I think the four-hour version is better because it takes its time more. It's a little more leisurely, and it, it has more time to explain everything. But it's a remarkably good film. Jim Diogenio wrote it with uh, for Stone, and uh, Jim has edited a book that's coming out um, in July of uh, complete transcripts of their interviews with a lot of really interesting. Uh, experts and, and a lot of documents and, and annotated scripts and stuff that should be an important book uh, jim has written really good books on the case and he's a great expert so I that, give him a that, lot of props yeah that is a really good uh, account but the point is uh, when when stone's jfk came out in 92 he ended with titles saying first of all he said you know he named names bell helicopter and uh, general dynamics and other companies made a fortune off the vietnam war you know and then he said millions of documents are being withheld uh, on this case. Why is this after all these years? If one man killed the president, you know, lone gunman with no motive, they, they could never prove a motive uh, because Oswald actually liked Kennedy. There were people who testified that he was fond of Kennedy and they didn't have a motive. But, you know, so then the Congress was sort of shamed into passing this JFK Records Act that mandated that within 25 years, all the records that were classified had to be released. And they had a, a board called the Assassination Records Review Board that <clears throat> collected all the documents from all the different government agencies that they could get a hold of. Some agencies were, were still uncooperative, like uh, CIA and the Secret Service withheld or destroyed some evidence. But they came out, they, they got a lot of, they got millions of pages of documents released and put in the National Archives and they put out a report. And a lot of these documents you can read online, but they've kept coming out over the years. But there was this deadline that they were supposed to be released in 25 years. And then, as I said, uh, uh, Trump uh, failed to do it. And there, I, I, I'm not sure the exact number is something like 1300 documents are still withheld it's way so, more than that. It's 180,000 documents that are still withheld. Now, depending on how much of those are one page things where they just have a couple of things added onto it, I give leeway to, but I think it's like a 5% or something of the documents, which is a total of 180,000. Well, it depends on the page count. Some are very long documents and it, it, that's where the discrepancy sometimes comes in that, you know, one document might be 500 pages and, uh, but yeah, I mean, and we don't totally know how many documents are uh, uh, unreleased. They're not going to reveal it to you. There's, there's I, like, I don't even understand the Freedom of Information Act. Oh, you guess the magic date and the numbers of a certain. They don't have to tell you anything when it comes to that stuff. And I get it; it's supposed to be law. But honestly, when people say like. I always say I'm not into politics. Now, I do get political 100%, but I don't like I consider it Illuminati and people go like, oh, that's that's conspiracy talk. I'm like, no, I think the Illuminati is not black cloaks and stuff like that. It's just a bunch of people that have a lot of money to be able to work the system in their favor. You see monopolies happen all the time when you watch your president, whether it's Democrat or Republican and people go, why isn't he? you know, doing everything that he promised he was going to do? And I go, because he doesn't have the power. 
he there's something else bigger at play, whether you want to say that's like the National Security Institute, what agency, whatever you want to say, there's something else there, a bunch of stuff that's set up and he's got information. And that's why they back down from a lot of their standpoints on things. I mean, if you really I, I, when people always say like Biden or there's this Trump, I get the polarization and the politics, but to me, that's bare surface stuff. When you start looking back about like, we take it back to JFK, they got away with something. You don't just stop doing something. If you're not, if you didn't get caught, you learn how to perfect it. You learn how to get better at it. I, I was going down this rabbit hole with Marilyn Monroe and linking it to JFK. Uh, but I later found out talking with Richard Bartholomew um, about like there's 10 years later after JFK's assassination, there was just slander articles about his character trying to deter from the assassination aspect of it, which makes a lot more sense. But there's a documentary right now on Netflix about Marilyn Monroe. Now, if you talk to the Marilyn Monroe people, they 100% think JFK was involved in her death. And I just, I, I get to this kind of aspect of things. I go, if Marilyn Monroe was still, was alive before the assassination of JFK, it would have just been a thousand times easier to get JFK to back down from his position by just slandering his character in that style of method. But I don't think we figured that out until later down the road. That's the best example would be Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton. I mean, the government, I, I, I think people really look at it like the government's not that evil. It's like, it's just bad actors. You have a lot of people that are in positions of power that have necessarily, when you're the bully on the playground, you don't know you're the bully at times. And I think that's where it's kind of headed this direction. I mean, we get split up on the semantics of Trump and Biden and all this presidential stuff. I'm, I'm a libertarian, I would say. I, I mean, I don't want to tear down the government at all. But I also I think it's needed 100 percent. I just think that we got to really make sure that they don't take like once they take power, like you see it with Roe versus Wade. I mean, mandates, whether you want to say be a good person, get your shot, whatever you allow something to make medical decisions for you, they're not going to stop after that becomes successful. And we see what happened with Roe versus Wade. That's a really big issue, but that's also, you gave, you're giving them power to make decisions where as a person, these are your rights. Well, we don't, you know, one, one of the things, and this, this has some relation to the Kennedy assassination that people feel helpless. You know, I mean, when the Iraq war was about to start, my son and I went out and marched in San Francisco and there were 10 million people around the world marched against them. Didn't do any good, didn't stop it. So what, what, is, what do people do to stop it? I mean, you can vote, you can try to influence politicians to pass laws in, in state legislatures. And you know, it's chaos now with what's gonna happen with Roe versus Wade. But to get back to your point about Biden or Trump, um, there's a comedian, Bill Hicks, I'd recommend people look him up on, on YouTube, a, a terrific guy who died too soon, but very acerbic guy. And he has a wonderful bit about what happens when you become president. He says, they take you into this room in the White House the first day. And he said, it's these uh, 10, 10 scum fucks who put you in office is the way he put it. And they all have suits and cigars and stuff. And they say, okay, we're gonna show you a movie. And they set the president down and uh, turn the lights off and they flip the switch and a film comes on. He said, it looks like this is a Bruder film, but it's not exactly from the right angle. It's a little different angle, you know, <clears throat> and they show the film and Kennedy's head has exploded and everything. And, and then uh, they turn the lights on and they turn to the president and they say, uh, any questions? And, and he says, what's my agenda? <laughs> And that's kind of probably metaphorically true that, you know, you find out with, say, Trump, uh, you know, the CIA and the FBI told him not to do it. And, you know, you listen to them because they have the power to do things. And, and uh, Biden, the same, you know, so there are some hidden powers. The deep state is what I mean, that's that's a term that's been abused. The right wing has appropriated it. Peter Dale Scott, who's a great historian of the Kennedy case, and he he kind of popularized or coined the term the deep state uh, talking about the hidden government that behind the scenes we have you know the, the props and the illusions of power that we think are running the country but uh you know the president is a transitory official uh, and uh, jfk points out the film that the president is put in office to kind of be a salesman for the american way of life and to kind of be a salesman for the military and industrial complex and but while, while uh, assuring us that we just want peace but it's really these you know corporations and 
uh, people behind the scenes who don't want publicity who are pulling the strings. And that's really true. And the more you dig into a case like the Kennedy case, you learn so much about the government studying it. And I was a very naive kid. I, you know, I came from a family. My mother was vice chairman of the state Democratic Party in Wisconsin. That's how I got into the Kennedy campaign. And I was sort of raised to think um, Democrats were good and Republicans were bad. And it was a two party system. And I, I didn't know anything about the CIA or the FBI at the time. And I learned by studying the case. And it's that's one of the things that's valuable for people to study the Kennedy case and study Watergate and uh, other important things. You learn an awful lot about the government, but but don't just read the mainstream press or the main mainstream books that get all the attention. You know, the books that get published by the main, the big publishers get a lot of money and publicity uh, usually lie about sensitive issues like Kennedy case, 9-11, certain things like that are third rail in American politics. You don't go near them. Like Robert Caro, who I think is a great biographer, his biography of Robert Moses is, is probably the best nonfiction book I've ever read. And he's done four volumes on Lyndon Johnson. And he's working on the final version. I hope he finishes it. But um, the first volume is great about Johnson's rise to power in the early days. And But when he gets to the fourth volume, which is dealing with the assassination and the aftermath, he lies, he, he tells a false story. Uh, for example, just one important example, he, he has this very you know dramatic uh, recreation of the events that went on that day, but he said that the Secret Service agent Rufus Youngblood jumped over the front seat in the, in the convertible and, and protected Johnson with his body. Well, it just didn't happen. I interviewed Senator Yarborough, who was in that back seat with LBJ and Lady Bird, and he said, first of all, Youngblood was a big man. He, he didn't jump over the seat. And if he had, there was no room for him in the back seat. He would have known if this big man had jumped over. And what, what really happened was uh, Yarborough said, you know, the sh shots were fired, the car, Kennedy's car stopped, Secret Service men poured around it, and then they took off. And I said, what were Johnson and Youngblood doing? And he said they were leaning over. There was a kind of a gap in the front seat between the driver and the passenger, Youngblood. And Youngblood had a walkie-talkie over his arm, a big one. And he and Johnson were listening to the walkie-talkie. There were two frequencies. There was one that was just communications within the motorcade. And there was another that connected to the White House Situation Room and the Pentagon, et cetera. Uh, and they were listening to one of the channels. And Johnson had his head down like this. and you know, they're both leaning together. That's why in the famous AP photograph of the shooting, Johnson's head is not visible. He's he's down like this. And uh, Penn Jones, who is my mentor, he was an independent newspaper editor, publisher in Texas. He used to say Johnson was the only one in the motorcade who ducked, you know, as if, as if he knew it was going to happen. But he was ducking because he was listening to the radio. And... Uh, uh, the, and I, I asked Youngblood, I said, um, what was Johnson's demeanor in the motorcade? Nobody ever asked about that before. And he said, well, he was very silent all the way through. It was very odd because Johnson was a very exuberant guy. But in the motorcade, he seemed very preoccupied that day. And he didn't respond to anybody, didn't wave to the crowd. And Youngblood said, I told him several times, you should wave to uh, the crowd is happy to see you. And he didn't do it. And I said, what do you attribute that to? And he said, well, this is what he later learned. You know, that day we we now know, and Carol writes about this in his book, that there was a Senate hearing going on in Washington where a guy named Don Reynolds was testifying about Johnson, demanding he pay a bribe to him. And uh, he had all the evidence. And there was the Bobby Baker scandal was going on, which was about Johnson's corruption financial corruption. Also, at the same time, Life magazine had a meeting of a task force of eight or 10 reporters who were doing an expose of Johnson's finances. they had already done a couple of articles about him. And all of this was about to hit the fan. The following Friday, they were considering running a big expose on Johnson's finances, and it didn't run because of the assassination. They pulled it. And uh, the Reynolds hearing continued because they didn't want to interrupt it because they wanted it to continue and they didn't tell Reynolds Kennedy had been shot until after the hearing and um, 
it, it, that you know Johnson was in danger of losing his job, either being dropped from the ticket or possibly going to jail. And uh, this, he had to do something that weekend. Things were closing in on him, you know. And, and Carol points that out. That's, that's part of the strengths of the book. But he, he fabricates some of the things, and he he buys the official story that Oswald did it, and it was a lone gunman shooting from behind. And that's the kind of book you write if, if to, he gets big money and, and big uh, awards. And if you write truthful books about the assassination as I and Diogenio do and other people, uh, quite a lot of us, um, they get small uh, readership. And, you know, my, I, I self-published my two books, Into the Nightmare and Political Truth, uh, which I like because you have complete freedom. You know, nobody's telling me what to write. Uh, and I sell them through Amazon, which is fine. It's a good way to reach people around the world. And, the, and there are a lot of people that buy it because there is a big audience for this kind of thing. And they're like blogs and, and podcasts like yours. That's where you get the truth out, you know, but you don't, you don't make the big bucks and you don't get the big awards. You don't get the reviews, but you get noticed by the right people, people who care about it. And that's, so it's, it's two alternative media tracks, you know, the, the mainstream media lying to you. And then the alternate media, which I think is good. That's one reason I, I don't like it when people attack the internet. I mean, I understand there's a lot of bad stuff on the internet and a lot of abuse, but the internet is, is a wonderful democratic tool because anybody can do a blog, anybody can do a podcast, and uh, people who are dissidents or uh, uh, marginal people, uh, you know, there's, there's the good, good people and bad people, but you can do a serious show like this one and you can get an audience for it and you get the truth out. And that, that was harder to do before the internet and before self-publishing books, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, it was hard to, hard to get a book out if, if uh, a major publisher wouldn't take it. And political truth, I actually offered to a major publisher back in the nineties and they wouldn't print it. But my, the editor there said, well, I believe there is a conspiracy, but we can't, print a book like yours attacking the New York Times because we rely on them too much for reviews for our books. You know, we can't attack them. So that's a great example of what happens in, in the, the mainstream media. I get books published by important publishers and university presses, et cetera. Uh, but the Kennedy books I did on my own. And and that's, so that's kind of the schism we have in America. There are two, two kind of channels of reality in the news. There's the fake news. And when the New York Times attacks Trump for claiming fake news, it, when Trump says fake news, he means news he doesn't like or people attacking him or whatever. But the New York Times puts out as much fake news as anybody. I mean, they put out fake news on the assassination and many other subjects over the years. Now, Rolling Stone, New York Times, Washington Post, everybody's put up an article, something about the vaccines or something about something that was false as hell but you know well i'll give you a couple of examples that are shocking there's a wonderful book called buried by the times by laurel leff i'd recommend it helped inspire me on political truth it's about how the new york times didn't cover the holocaust properly they covered uh, they covered it up basically they 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 would print stories she went through all the papers for the period of the Holocaust and, and was showing how little they reported on what was happening. For example, in June of 41, they ran a, a little story and it was on like page 22 or something. And it, it was like four or five paragraphs. It says, said, stories out of Eastern Europe said that 2 million Jews have been killed in recent months, you know, which is actually true. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they buried it way inside the paper. And she said, when you bury a story way inside the paper and, and you run just a little short thing, it says to the reader, we don't really believe this, or you know, we don't think this is important. They didn't put it on page one. And this, this was a pattern all through the Holocaust. They really blew that story, which had terrible consequences. The American public wasn't fully aware of what was going on. And if they had been, they might've demanded more action from our government. And then another notorious example, they had a, their, their Moscow bureau chief during the famine in Russia that Stalin engineered a famine that killed millions of Russians, he lied about it and covered it up and denied it. And he won a Pulitzer Prize. Walter Durandi was his name. And the, even the Times is ashamed of it. They ran a story years later 
uh, saying, well, this is terrible, the guy just lied about it. And, uh, but they, they, they've labeled the story opinion. You know, they didn't even say, we're really sorry for this. And they haven't given back the Pulitzer Prize. But, you know, so they've, they've covered up some really, really important stories in our country. And they mis, misled us in Vietnam. And the Washington Post misled us in Vietnam and Watergate and a lot of things. And, and so we get a lot of our history is false. Uh, uh, Oscar Wilde said history is just gossip. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of history is lies. And the film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the great John Ford film, really deals with that. It was made the year before the assassination and it has a scene, a kind of a grassy knoll scene in which it shows what really happened. This villain was shot secretly by somebody else and, and the man who people think shot him becomes a polit political hero. And, at the end of the film, he tries to tell the truth and, and the press won't print it. The editor says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend, that's a famous line. And that's what we do. A lot of our history in America is legendary and people believe it. And when you try to tell the truth about the assassination or 9-11 or other uh, very controversial subjects, you get attacked a lot and you have to learn to live with that. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I had to kind of learn that over the years because you sometimes your friends don't want to hear about it. Or, I mean, I start political truth with a, a story about an old friend from college. When I did my book Into the Nightmare, I told her about it by email. She she didn't want to read it, and she said, I, I, "Aren't you interested in any contemporary political issues?" And I wrote back to her. I said, "This is a contemporary political issue." You know, for the reasons I just told you, it's this is one of the reasons we have this terrible situation in our country that led to the January 6th attempted coup. And I never heard back from her again. Although actually I heard back from her recently. She wrote me out of the blue for some reason. I don't know why, but you know, she was very offended that I cared about the assassination. And you get that kind of question, like, why do you care about this ancient history? And, well, it's not ancient history. It's it happened a long time ago, but it's it still affects our world today, and it, it really had terrible ripple effects in our country. Um, I'm sure we can do a whole other podcast about political corruption. I definitely want to book that in there. But um, like I said, I want to get you on the panel episode. But is there a place where people can find your links to any of your books and any other social media stuff if you have any? Um, uh, please promote it, and um, I'll make sure I link it in the description as well too. Thank you. Well, I have a website on Into the Nightmare. And um, uh, let's see, I can tell you, I had a uh, general website about my career. And then I, I, I was so busy last year, I did four books that came out in about six months period. And I, I forgot to renew my main website, but into the nightmare.com, you can find photographs and, and uh, articles and interviews. And then I did a, a book called uh, frankly about frank capra how i expose the truth about this great american director it's called franklycapra.com then i did one a book called how did lubitsch do it about ernst lubitsch and i have how did lubitsch do it.com and i did a collection of my short articles it's called two chairs for hollywood so i have two chairs for hollywood.net and then I did a memoir. It took me 49 years off and on writing a memoir of my uh, troubled youth uh, called The Broken Places. And it's thebrokenplaces.info. But the best way to look up my various books is go on Amazon. They have author pages. You can click on the author name. And a lot of the authors have a page where they have, I have a bio that I wrote. And, and they, they list all the books that I have available on Amazon. Most of my books are in print. A few are out of print. I'm trying to get them back into print. but. Uh, that way you can find uh, links to most of my books. And I've done, in, I did a book on Billy Wilder called Billy Wilder Dancing on the Edge, which came out last uh, October, big critical study. I spent a long time on, he's one of my favorite filmmakers. And then I did the uh, Kennedy book, Political Truth, the, the Media and the Assassination of President Kennedy. And in January, I did um, a new edition of my book, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, A Portrait of an Independent Career. I brought that up to date. And then in March, I did a short uh, critical study of the Coen brothers called uh, uh, The Whole Dern Human Comedy, Life According to the Coen Brothers. So I was very busy. Uh, and these four books, some of them took a long time, some took a shorter period, but they all came together at the same time. 
so people can find them and buy them on Amazon. Um, you know, it's a handy, it's very good for authors. Amazon, you know, a big thing for Amazon too, and people attack Amazon, but um, they, uh, you're able to self-publish a book through what they call Fulfillment House. I'm on there. Are you? Yeah, what's yeah. your book? My podcast is uh, Amazon, uh, it's, it's sold on Amazon. It's free, but it's like an audible thing you can listen to. Oh, great. You can, you can find it on Amazon. Well, yeah, see, Amazon is a boon for independent writers and uh, authors who have a book that is hard to sell to a ma major publisher because it's controversial or it's offbeat or something. And uh, it, it's when, when they started listing those books, it was a tremendous boon. The other big boon for independent publishing is when you could uh, set your own book and type you know or hire somebody to do it it doesn't cost very much money and, and make it look for very professional and you can then have it you know, printed on demand by uh, uh independent companies i do with uh, several of my books but i still publish books with uh, columbia university press for example my wilder and lubitsch books but so they're, they're again they're like two tracks of publishers in america you know the <clears throat> the mainstream ones that pew to the official stories but you know with Lubitsch and Wilder there's no uh, controversy uh, about you know reporting the truth about it my Capra book uh, I, I had a great trouble getting that book published because I exposed a lot of lies that Frank Capra and other people had put out about him and uh, revealed that he was an informer during the blacklist years which nobody knew and I had tremendous opposition my original publisher Knopf and Capra's um, archivist Janine Basinger of Wesleyan University tried to stop my book and so I spent four years fighting a legal battle to get that book out and I had to switch publishers to go to Simon & Schuster and I found an honest editor and publisher there and I published Frank Capra The Catastrophe of Success and then I wrote a 600 page book called Frankly Unmasking Frank Capra about how difficult it was to research and write that book. I think it's kind of a very suspenseful Kafka-esque uh, book, which has a lot of suspense and black comedy. It's interesting for anybody who wants to know how difficult it is to tell the truth about a major American cultural figure. And the same thing is true with uh, the Kennedy assassination. <clears throat> Telling the truth about that is not an easy thing to do, but it's a very important thing to do. Well, I'm going to make sure I link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, and thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.